allows to see the process of selection and condensation modification she uses when she's using an existing source. And in these documents, one sees no evidence whatever that her or her editors were trying to disguise that she was using a source. It's simply using an efficient selection, condensation, and arrangement process. In fact, Mrs. White herself sometimes lists her source. Here, in writing a manuscript about Luther's experience, she notes page 240 of a book titled Words That Shook the World. Well, this is Charles Adams' book, Words That Shook the World. Adams, no relation to the Adams, famous Adams family, wrote a lot of books in where he popularized the uh, thing. And Adams, what Adams was doing, he was condensing Merle Daubigny, the big, you know, history of Protestantism. He was condensing Daubigny. And Ellen White was condensing Adams. Now, if you didn't know about this, you look at Ellen White's material, and you'd compare it with Daubigny, and you say, well, yeah, she was like Daubigny. She was, but look at all the stuff she skipped. Well, yeah, but, you know, you need to get the in, 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 intervening source uh, to understand what's going on. Now, we'll hasten toward a conclusion here. Perhaps these examples I've managed to stumble onto over the years are just flukes. Anomalies. The study of Ellen White's handwritten documents would be a barren waste for scholars, dry and boring, except for the very rare and insignificant instances of Mrs. White's editors, because they always stayed, uh, because Mrs. White's editors always stayed very close to her handwritten drafts. On the other hand, perhaps the study will be a rich forest of insight and information and inspiration. The Ellen G. White Board of Trustees, shown here, includes many talented people. They can consider what should be done, if anything, to determine the value of studying Ellen White's handwritten documents. And if they discover that such a study might be valuable, they can determine what steps should be taken to facilitate uh, her autographs. Now, don't go writing letters about this presentation. We are trying to persuade even conservative people even Ed Zinke, wait a minute, Ed Zinke and I were ordained to the gospel ministry on the same platform at the same time. Now, if you, we need to convince Ed Zinke that it would be a good idea to look at Ellen White's holographs. You see what I mean? So don't, don't go causing any controversy. We'll just move along gently and we'll persuade all these people. I think we probably have an ally in Lisa Beardsley and, uh, and so on. And, uh, Few more. There is no group photograph of the White State Board since 1996. But thanks to the internet, I have gathered all this. Can't hide from me. Okay. Um, now, the, I have a suggestion of something that could be done, and that is they are now working on the next volume. You take it from 1860 to 18. 67 or something like that, the next volume of annotations. What they should do is they should carefully look at the, the holographs of all the documents that they're editing. And if they find something interesting or informative and so on, put it in the annotation. You don't have to, you know, you publish some samples, but then take all of the documents that are represented in the new volume and, and put the holographs in all the research centers and all the, uh, the branch offices. Now, if that doesn't cause an explosion, a controversy, and so on, then put it online. You know. But the, the point is that we can take some cautious, easy steps uh, to find out if this is useful or if it will bring out uh, so many crazies that we, uh, we can't stand it. Um, Fred Veltman's, um, Fred Veltman's uh, Desire of Ages study is online. So I just took a page at random, just to show it, okay? And he has transcribed it, so, you know, in, in some cases he's trying to be literal, because he puts these thick things in, so on. Um, but when I look at it, I discover it's not really a scholarly transcri uh, trans uh, transcription, because he does not include the cancellations. So here Mrs. White is describing Lucifer as an angel next to Christ, in majesty, in purity, glory, in the heavenly courts. 
And then she starts thinking to herself, wait a minute, Satan was never next to Christ in purity. Majesty and glory, perhaps, those are external things, but no, we're not going to even ascribe purity to the unfallen Lucifer. So she crosses it out. Well, now, maybe it wasn't a thought process at all. Maybe the angel whispered in her ear, I don't care, I want to see it. I want to see that at first she was going to say that Lucifer had purity, and then she changed it. Now, even if this was transcribed in perfect scholarly style, the editor who did it might make mistakes. You see this here? This was translized, translated, as it became. Now, I happen to know that this that looks like a B is sometimes Ellen White's initial H. So this should say he was the originator of sin, not became the originator of sin. He was the originator of sin. So again, uh, if you have a scholarly trans transcription and you yourself can see the handwriting, then you can decide for yourself. Did they get it right? Did they get it wrong? You know, my only fear is these people that have these bizarre, zany hobby horses to promote, they'll go in and find something that, they say, oh, that says X or Y or Z or something that they want it to say. But I think there's enough of us that we can uh, prevent that. Okay. Given the important and extensive work in which the White Estates is engaged at the moment, the time is perhaps not right for them to do anything about the handwritten documents. But meanwhile, if you would like to volunteer to help me, we can go to work on the more than 100 pages of holographic facsimiles already published. We can transcribe them according to scholarly standards and examine instances where they differ from the current published transcriptions. We can have a, we can have a workshop here on the Sabbath afternoon. I can show you how to do it. We'll give you a copy of this letter, and we'll give him a copy of this letter, and see if you come up with the same thing. If you do, we know we can trust it. If not, we'll get her to look at it and see if it's right. Okay, anyway, we can note the cancellations, the emendations in the original yield uh, that are not visible in the published version. If we can make a strong enough case, our research might even be used to persuade major donors to contribute to what could be an expensive pro project, although I think the mere um, scanning and, and uh, putting the digital copies in the research center would not be enormously expensive. Publishing a scholarly edition would be very uh, expensive. So that's the end. There's my email if you want to volunteer to help, and my phone number. And uh, now um, let's see how we're doing on time. We have a little time for questions, and then we'll take a break when those of you want to make uh, the beginning of the service over there, you can leave. And those of you who can wait until the sermon starts can stay for a little longer discussion. <laughs> Maybe, Dr. Lefkoff, you want to say something uh, before we move on to other people? Because you're the, um, the expert on these matters in the room, in addition to Ron. Well, I, 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 I appreciate your presentation, and I think that, as you have rightly noted, the White Estate it has been, I have worked only three years, so I cannot even compare to your experience, but the White Estate is pretty much very slow to get moving, you see? And I think that even with the steps that they have taken to publish the letters and the manuscripts online, it's a, it's a quite a you know, jump ahead yeah. of, of, of the time. So I think that eventually that will be done and maybe what I think it's, I mean, you're talking about textual criticism. So how many people, and you mentioned that, how many people are really interested in that? Probably those a few of us uh, that will really make uh, such a study will, will really be of value or will be interesting and will be curious to see that. But I think that the world has moved and so the white state is trying to do their job in the 21st century. Now, these are good questions for me and you. But let me tell you, the new generation, they don't care about that. Let, let me. So, they, so 
what do you do with that, right? Yeah. The, the second me, uh, point. The second point. Just okay, before, okay, the second point is also uh, financially. Do you know that I have been one of the the, the, the main supporters or movers for the annotated yeah. books, and we have run out of money. And I have pleaded just a few months ago in our board meeting. I have pleaded that we need to find sponsors for that project to continue because the second volume is from 1860 to 1863. Oh, 63, mm, yeah. And it will take another two years. We just, uh, unfortunately, Stan Hickerson just passed away two, two weeks ago from a cancer. Their so editor, we, yeah. Yeah, we need an, another person. We don't have the money to continue that. Imagine that Ellen White started to write much more. Yes. And we don't have money for that. So there, there's, it, it's much more complex than, you know, the wire estate not willing to release it or anything no, like and, that. And it's I, it's, it's <coughs> very complex. And, 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 I, and I realize that. Can we turn on the lights so I have lights down here? Um, I, I realize that there, there, there are two responses. First of all, uh, just, just uh, scanning the holographs and getting them in the research center is going to be enormously expensive, number one. Number two, if, if there becomes more of an awareness that there might be something valuable here for people like you and me, then we might find wealthy donors who will support that. But let, uh, and, uh, but let me point out one other analogy. It's maybe not totally fair. But let's suppose, let's suppose that um, a Catholic archaeologists discovered, it's impossible this will ever happen, but they discovered the actual holograph of the Epistle to the Romans, Paul's own handwritten Greek manuscript of the Epistle to the Romans. And they put it in the Vatican archives, and the Vatican archives said, ah, most people don't care about this. Um, you know, you've got the King James Version, what more do you want? Oh, no, it's all really expensive to transcribe Paul's uh, holograph of the Oh, my goodness. If, if, you know, that, of course, the parallel is not exactly uh, even, even though Colin Standish calls Ellen White the greatest of all the prophets. You know, the book by the title, the greatest of all, why? Because she wrote more than any of the other prophets. Oh, boy. <laughs> but anyway, but anyway, um, I think that, that's, that's a valid question. Is there enough value, number one? Is there enough interest, and is there enough money? But, but Ron, you're making the assumption that somehow those things are not available. I know you want to have them more available on the internet, but they are available. So the example that you give, it's not really, because if you want to see the and compare the, the, the original writings, right, the, the, uh, with, with the, the transcribed letters, you can go to the general conference and see it. So it's not that they're hidden and you're not allowed to do that. But I see your point, and I agree with you. But and I it say, will eventually happen. I say easily accessible. <laughs> you know, I don't want to travel to Rome to see the holograph of the Epistle to the Romans. Okay, you. Yeah. Well, you may I make just a small point, and that is uh, Dr. Lefkowitz mentioned textual criticism. Here's just an excursus. When biblical scholars talk about lower criticism, this is what they mean, examining the text itself. When they talk about higher criticism, they're talking about studying the context of the text, not the text itself, but the context. So there's nothing wrong about lower criticism, and there's nothing wrong about higher criticism, even though one often hears that there could be. So that's just a little sermon on the way. Yes. Uh, Robin Van der Bolen from Portland, Oregon. Uh, you are the most esteemed, elegant, and erudite of the uh, Ellen White scholars. Thank you very much. <laughs> My comment is I'm very itinerant, and as I travel around, whether it's big churches, small churches, conservative or liberal churches, I almost fall off my pew if these days I hear spirit of prophecy from the pulpit. That said, she is always the elephant in the room. Two examples. 
we will always be a young creationist church despite scientific evidence because she says 6,000 years. And in decades, I have never heard a sermon on the investigative judgment. It's as dead as a dodo bird. But because she embraced it, we will always be stuck with it. Not to comment on those two, it would take all day. But wouldn't you concede that the red books are as important to Adventism as the much derided Book of Mormon is to the Mormons. And I want you to comment on sola scriptura, the whole concept. We have such an enormous weight on Ellen White, even when she is ostensibly wrong. For instance, as a South African, I find it racist, reprehensible, and politically incorrect, her statement on blacks mingling with whites. So comment on sola scriptura for us in Adventism. Well, now, these are about five different topics for later. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is, the first one, is, I, I, I think, I think that, uh, you know, I, back in the day, in, in the, my wife could hardly stand me because it was like I was married to Ellen White and would talk about her in every, <laughs> every social gathering and everything. I was studying her. And then there came a time, you know, after I stopped teaching, when I just sort of put it aside, you know? And, it, and I didn't think about it, didn't talk about it and everything. But now, for some reason, I've gotten interested again. Well, but there's this huge gap uh, of time and study and so on. And I would say that Tim, Tim Poirier, both the Tim Poirier and Jim Nixon, way, way ahead of me in understanding uh, this material. And I would say that Gil Valentine if you want a person who's a little more progressive. Did Gil make it here today? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, he is. OK, good, good. Uh, he's, he's way ahead. And believe it or not, even Jonathan Butler is ahead of me. You think of Jonathan Butler as a, you know, an apostate and everything. But uh, you know, uh, he, he really, he really uh, has a lot of information, interest, and he's kept his interest up more than I have. So I just want to dissuade you of thinking of me as an expert, although, you know, I learned a, a little in those years. And, and, and really, yes, I, I know that, that there's this, this tension between a, a lot of ministers and a lot of lay people live as if, as if these things are not important at all, but then they are in the background. So I don't really know how to relate to that. I think we need to get back to the Sola Scripturio vis-a-vis Ellen White in a, in a more extensive way. Uh, we're going to continue this over the years and months. I would like to have a session called Ellen G. White and Church Race Relations Revisited, mm -hmm. because Ron wrote a book on that some years ago, and it would be interesting to see how our thinking has changed or not changed, and how our understanding of her has changed or not changed. So I think let's put that on the agenda. And if we can get Benjamin Baker, Del, uh, Delbert Baker's son, who's in the General Conference archives and who is the specialist in Black Adventist history, for him and I to talk together, that would be great. Okay, let's put that on the agenda. Dr. Testament. Hey, uh, just thinking again about the problem of getting enough of the funds and effort <coughs> to get enough scholars together to mm -hmm. work on annotated versions of these uh, manuscripts. Uh, just thinking about a parallel here, uh, things like that are not done the same way that they used to be, getting together and putting together a published book any longer in this day of texting and social media and that kind of thing. Uh, just to take one example, actually it goes back a few years now when many of the manuscripts, I believe it was Dead Sea Scroll manuscripts, were being pretty much held in uh, Israel and a, a small group of scholars had control of them and were putting out annotated editions at, at a snail's pace and lot. They needed money and they needed funding and, and it was going to take 20, 30 years and this sort of thing. Well, some scholar managed to get his hands on the holographs and just simply put them on the internet. 
And there was screaming and yelling and lawsuits and everything else. Uh, well, maybe there weren't lawsuits, I don't know. Uh, but immediately, every graduate student in every seminary and religious studies place just went to work on these things. And you can now find all kinds of scholarly work related to those. And uh, I'll use one more example here, Wikipedia. There was, uh, was preceded by Encarta. Microsoft put a, a version of sort of an Encyclopedia Britannica online, it's called Encarta. They stopped doing it because it was so expensive to pay all these people to do all the research and to keep it up. Then somebody started Wikipedia. It is done free. Scholars work on it for the fun of it, and they put in their information. Wikipedia hardly costs anything because all the work is done by people scattered all over the place that contribute. Couldn't something like that be done here? Well, and, and the fact is that uh, we're not talking about ancient Hebrew script here. We're right. talking about English. Right, so right, of the Jesus Jesus. And I don't think it takes scholars to do this. I mean, if, if, we, if we work together and, and check each other's work, I think we could, and everybody in this room could learn to read Elder White's Just handbook. put it online and everybody well, we're going to we're gonna start one with one question or come. Yes, we're in the back. Please. I was just going to say vis-a-vis -vis Ellen White, the Bible, and the kind of somewhat simmering debate over inerrancy. Uh, Alton Thompson shared recently that his book, Inspiration, Hard Questions, Honest Answers, published about 30 years ago by the Review and never republished by them, uh, is scheduled for re-release oh, coming soon uh, by an independent publisher. Very good. And I haven't read it myself, but I recommend anything by Alan Thompson. Uh, well, that's going to be a now. very big contribution. Now, uh, I think we can have a, a study group here working along with Ron and on the internet. It reminds me of the School of Matthew, right? A lot of people think the Gospel of Matthew was put together by a group of people. Uh, Dr. Randolin is, I hope I'm not getting out there too far. He's a New Testament scholar. So many of the books of the Bible were group projects. And so this is helping us to understand the Bible. And the Bible helps us to understand this. Next week, emotional intelligence. Right. Do you have it? Do you wish you had it? Are you sorry some people around you don't have it? Right? All those things. Can it be learned? Aristotle said nobody can be virtuous as a young person. It takes time to develop virtues. So probably nobody can be emotionally intelligent at birth. Well, that takes time, if Aristotle's right. So we'll do, do that next time. And then after that, I think we'll begin with Gary Chartier. I'm not quite sure because I haven't uh, settled that entirely. If I can't, I'll do it myself on the uh, California End of Life Act. All right, say after me. May the Lord watch between me and thee. May the Lord watch between me and thee. While we're absent, one from another. While we're absent, one from another. See you in a week. Those of you who want to stay here,